episode six of our seven-part series, we meet the most successful male model right now, Sean O'Pry. Just like Hollywood has its bankable and popular leading men, so too does the world of fashion. In the world of cinema, leading man is one of those movie terms you take for granted. But what exactly is he leading? Or who? And to where? He, or his films, are leading the box office opening weekends. I'm the king of the world! <laughs> and today, he's the one who's all over mainstream and also social media. Cinema's leading men didn't change much over the course of the 20th century. Their clothes and hairstyles may have differed from decade to decade, but they all sport an air of sophistication and charm. <coughs> That's really nice. They include some of the best actors in the history of film, and regardless of the era or genre, these men have dazzled audiences for generations. No one else! We had Cary Grant, Marlon Brando, James Dean, Harrison Ford, Brad Pitt, and more recently we've had Leonardo DiCaprio, The Rock, Ryan Gosling, and Timothy Chalamet. That's wonderful news. Romance and sex seem bound up in that meaning. 20th Century Fox casting executive Sharon Klein got at that idea way back in 2007 when she told Variety, you want to pick someone a man wants to be and a woman wants to do. That you can trust and who can consistently make you money. Sound fair enough? Identification, lust, and maybe some envy have always been attached to the term. No, 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 no. My Ferrari was white like Don Johnson's in Miami Vice, not red. The types of leading male archetypes change decade by decade, and so has a leading man in fashion. No question, in the 90s and the noughties, we had Marcus Schenkenberg, Tyson Beckford, and David Gandhi who ruled the game. But today we have Sean O'Pry. In fashion, the leading man is easy to spot. He's the one who's making cameos in the biggest female stars' music videos. Blank Space, Taylor Swift. 
Girl Gone Wild Madonna. They have their own luxury fragrance campaigns, Spice Bomb, Victor and Rolf. They star as the face of the biggest designer brands campaigns, Armani, Zara. And it's not just the work, they also sit atop the Forbes list of top industry earners and feature top of the rankings at models.com main categories, money guys, supers, top icons. No question about it, based on all available criteria. Today, Sean O'Pry is it. I mean, Handsome is the first word that comes to my mind. Uh, the eyes are unbelievable. The, the, again, the, the proportion is incredible. And he's another one who takes his craft very seriously, but doesn't take himself so seriously. Uh, and those, those are the kind of people we, we, we like working with. They respect what they do, but they realize that their you know life goes on without them. And uh, it's Sean and, too. And, and when you're to... someone that good looking and can, you know really, and you're so unpretentious and so unaffected by how you look, it makes you all the more handsome. Uh, Sean is special. He is, is visually. I mean, he's it's just you know that dark hair, those blue eyes, the the amazing cheekbones, the whole stature. He's uh, he's a great guy to highlight. Yeah, Sean O'Pry is one of today's top male models. Born on July 5th, 1989, in Kennesaw, Georgia, USA. The top model is best known for his piercing blue eyes and all-American good looks. He even channels a pretty good James Dean sultry pout. Kennesaw was quite small when I was born, but it, it became, it, it blew up actually after the Olympics came. It was like 4,000 when I was born and now it's somewhere in like 30 plus thousand and we have one of the largest colleges in the state of Georgia. So there's, it's now almost a college town, but it was, it was phenomenal. Like we used to have these parades down. We used to watch the 4th of July fireworks in downtown. I, I love, I love growing up in Georgia. I love country. I mean, I guess growing up down South, it, it makes you think of other things that are important. Like I never grew up in a city. I never went to a city till I was 17. I mean, I'm definitely Georgia born, Georgia bred. One day I'll be Georgia dead. Like I, I love being from Georgia. I'm very proud of that. Uh, we're a very, we're getting to become a very progressive state, which is amazing. And like, I, I, I really love my childhood. I had the best friends, Jerome, Jeremy, Randy, Adam, Antoine. I got to play sports, you know? I mean, it's very, very simple, but it was very nice. I'm John, I'm Sean's father. I work as a registered respiratory therapist in Savannah, Georgia. I'm the guy that puts the tube down into the lungs and ventilates the patient. Ironically, John's medical path as a respiratory therapist was to be foreshadowed by a life and death moment he faced with Sean when Sean was just eight months old. He's barely breathing. And he's foaming at the mouth. Uh, we'll just try and get him sitting up, try and keep him calm and comfortable. I got help coming to you, okay? Thank you. Shortness of breath. Six Baby Sean had contracted meningococcemia, a rare infectious disease characterized just like COVID 19 by upper respiratory tract infection, fever, lesions, eye and ear problems, and a sudden state of extreme physical depression or shock. In a strong adult, it can be life-threatening. In a baby, it's a death sentence. I was, I had meningococcemia, which is meningitis as a child. So uh, it's, it's actually it's quite a serious disease. And it has a pretty high fatality rate in children or, you know, deaf, blindness, amputation. 
can easily get affected by how unwell the children around you are, how fragile they are sometimes, and you know there are occasions when it's life-death decisions being made, their life is in the balance. What Sean contracted when he was eight months old was meningococcemia. Meningitis is in the cerebral spinal fluid and is usually not totally lethal, but can be very dangerous. Uh, you can definitely die from it, but definitely is not a good illness. What Sean had was meningococcemia. That means the organism that causes the meningitis was in his bloodstream instead of the spinal fluid, which means it's a thousand times more lethal. There are not many people that have ever survived it. What baby Sean had contracted was not just an illness. It was a death sentence. The doctors treating him consulted each other in the infant ICU and conferred that Sean had just hours to live if he did not respond to the treatment. The clock on Sean's infant life was ticking down. As a medical professional, it scared the life out of me. I literally, they gave him a 50-50 chance to make it through the first night. And the doctor called me, I was expecting the worst call in the world every parent never wants to hear, and said, you need to come in here. And I was like, why? Why do we need to come in? He says, you just need to come in. Fearing the worst, John drove like a demon to Scottish Rite Children's to find Dr. Tamara Fuller. After arriving at the hospital and finding Dr. Fuller, the doctor took John to the ICU. John's heart was beating 120 per minute. And he showed me, he said, I think he's gonna be fine. He was literally shaking the crib. <laughs> he had done a complete turnaround that first night. And I got very fortunate. And so I always, when I get a chance, help out at Scottish Rite Children's Hospital because they saved my life. O'Prior reports having Irish and unspecified Native American heritage. He has an elder brother and a younger sister, and he attended North Cobb High School. I loved my childhood. I was out every day in the summer when the sun came up, come back when the streetlights come back on. Dad would whistle, that was us. That was like our bell. And we just played with the neighborhood kids, and I played baseball, football, and basket, basketball and track. So it was quite busy. Standing tall at six foot one with his striking features, it's no surprise that Sean was destined to model, even if it all happened to him totally by chance. Still in peaceful dreams. Noel Marin, a judge on America's Next Top Model, discovered Sean after spotting his prom pictures on his MySpace page. Marin alerted Lana Winters, president of VNY Models, and Sean was literally plucked from obscurity with no prior experience in modeling or even a vague interest in fashion and thrown headfirst into the major leagues from the get-go. And it would literally save him and his family from a really difficult time. I never even thought about having a career. Uh, 2006 was a really bad time. There was financial issues and I had an opportunity to help support my family and I took it. So one day I was in school and one day I left. And, you know, Lana saved my life. She helped get us through a difficult time. O'Prye is a devoted animal lover and owns a golden retriever named Tallulah Von Ruffworth. He was named after famous Tallulah Gorge of Georgia. According to Sean's Twitter, both he and Tallulah share the same hairstylist. Kennesaw, Georgia is a unique place. Um, very small, not very large, a suburb of Atlanta. Uh, the only city, I believe, in the United States that requires you to own a gun as a city ordinance. So very low crime rate, um, but very, almost a country. Um, still believe in respect out there, still believe in yes ma'am, no ma'am, always yes sir, no sir. Please, thank you is very much enforced. That's uh, how Sean was brought up. So he definitely drops back into the Southern boy very easily. He should be respectful to everybody at all times. That's how 
I was brought up, that's how he was brought up. Sean is extremely athletic. There's not a sport he's ever tried. He hasn't been able to pick up and do well. Um, made me jealous, actually, that I always had to work at everything and it just came naturally to him. Um, he never lacked for friends. He always had people around him. He seemed to draw people to him without even trying. So, um, the only person that made it hard on Sean was Sean. He is an extremely competitive nature. So, he wanted to be the best at everything he did. Hi, I'm Karen. I'm Sean's mom. I was born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia. When Sean left for New York, it was very difficult for me. I was very worried about him as a mom. Um, he was 17 years old and he'd been with me every day of his life. So I was extremely worried, but I knew he'd be okay. He had Lana and I thought that was marvelous that she stayed in contact with me. To say that Sean's career success was a surprise to him is an understatement. I thought I'd be up here for like six months, make a little bit of money and go back. I got that first check and I was like, bye. <laughs> I came to New York with $150. That's all I had. <laughs> and I thought that would be enough for like a couple months. It wasn't. <laughs> I was a bit of a wild child. I won't lie about that. I put my photo on MySpace and we found, you know, the model. Definitely not. Found the, um, just searching through pages. And I mean, it took a lot of time to see that I wanted a model, but when it did, it's gone really well. It's a good adventure. When I first started, my uh, first six months, I shot the Calvin Klein collection. Okay. And I mean, after that, I mean, I just worked with some great people this season. D Squared, L Staff. I, I'm getting on my way to becoming a man. I was a little boy when I started being mature, rude, arrogant, cocky. And now you just realize that, yeah, I was annoying. <laughs> When I was, when we first started uh, back in November 27, 2006, uh, it's funny because her father picked me up at the airport and I still remember uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer was paying, playing on the, on the radio. And I remember my mother took me to Express right before to get a really nice outfit so they could greet me. And I remember I came in and it looked like I bought some, like I just bought this black shirt, black pants. And I'm waiting at the airport and this Ukrainian man comes up to me. He's like, are you Sean? And I was like, holy <laughs> shit. I've never met anyone from the Ukraine before. <laughs> and it was her father. And so they drive me into the city and they drive me to 928 Broadway. And they go up to the sixth floor and there's her, uh, Damien. And it was all overwhelming. I've never seen a modeling agency or anything. And then I had all these castings and they asked me, like, what are your clothes like? And I showed them, and they were like, well, we're gonna have to take you shopping. <laughs> and I went to a casting. After Sean left home to come to New York, his career was quite, um, it came very quickly. I think your looks are only like 25, 30% of it. Personality and presence are the thing that are the most. In just over 18 months in the business, Sean O'Pry, an 18-year-old from Georgia with pillow lips and hooded blue eyes has shot campaigns for Calvin Klein, D Squared, Ferre, and Giorgio Armani. It's just naturally great. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> and it was just wonderful to see him succeed. I knew he was a hard worker. I just had no idea what to expect. He's the one that did the work to get where he is. When Sean left home at 17, seeing him succeed, it was I was extremely proud of that. Um, it was also wonderful to, to be able to witness it, um, share it with our family and friends. Very exciting to have people come up to us and compliment him and say how proud of them, him that everyone was. All of his friends, family. It was fun to walk into the malls and see him on H&M posters, the Gap posters. Um, we all took pictures of them and stood in front of them and, and we text them to him to let him know what was going on back in Georgia. Be 
Beginning his career in 2006, Sean signed to VNY Model Management in New York City. I'm Sean O. I'm from VNY Model Management, and I'm from Kennesaw, Georgia. went to this Barney's casting. It was like one of the biggest castings that was happening in New York at that time. It was for a campaign with a supermodel girl at that time. And he had no portfolio. He had absolutely nothing except a Polaroid sheet we had just done on him at the agency. And that's what he went to this first casting with. And out of all the people, and you know the top models and everyone that's in New York City, this kid from Kennesaw that just arrived booked the campaign with a Polaroid sheet. Hey, my name is Nicola Formichetti. I am, uh, I actually don't know what I do exactly. <laughs> I I'm a lover of fashion and style. Um, I've been in business for the last 20 years. I do from designing to styling to creative direction. I worked for magazines, um, celebrities and brands. I think Shona Pry. I think I'm the first one that he worked with. Um, we flew him to London, and when the agent sent me his photos, I just thought he looked like this old classic Hollywood, ancient Greek, like just movie star quality. And, and I remember I was doing a shoot for uh, Days or Ten Magazine in an editorial in London, and he was so not like the other boys that we were like, we have to shoot him. And yeah, it, it was incredible. Um, I remember, I think we shot like three editorial back to back in a day. He was so hungry for camera. He knew he was a first time modeling, but he knew he was just natural, you know. And um, yeah, he was incredible. Because because he is so of like he you know he's not super tall you know but his proportion and he's so charming but then in from the camera he, he has this look that is it's like 1950s meet ancient roman greek uh but like super fashionable beautiful and then it also felt like so sort of like um like a, one of the caravaggio character you know very like like um yeah, he didn't have to do much. He was just kind of like posing and beautiful. He, we were like, have you ever modeled before? Because he was a pro from day one. Um, I remember we shot three stories back to back in a day. Incredible. I still remember that day really clearly. Like we did one in the studio, one in the location. And yeah, he, I remember he just flew in I think he was in Florida or New York and we flew him to London and yeah, straight to the, to, to the studio. Sean clearly has a deep respect and appreciation for his agent Lana Winters, the president of VNY Models who has personally guided and guarded Sean's career. To this day, Lana is still very much personally hands-on with Sean's career. I don't know how many times I have to say I've been very fortunate and very, very lucky to get to where I'm, or supposedly where I'm at, or people assume I'm at. But that
It was very soon after he started. I'm not sure. It was it was like really quick after he started. I'll just tell you, if you see that video, it's terrible. I mean, if you can find it, you just might see like a cutaway of a kid running down the runway. That's me. I was terrified, man. You ever had 500 people stare at you while you're walking? Especially knowing that you're pigeon toed, it gets a lot worse. Like you think you might have a slight pigeon toe when 500 people are looking at you, it turns into quite a severe pigeon toe. It was terrible. I don't know if I should give anyone tips on how to do a runway walk, to be completely honest. And after you see the video, you understand why. I can teach you how to be pigeon toed and uncomfortable. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'd ever take my advice of, you know, I've walked off a runway, I've walked down the runway wrong, I've completely missed my exit. Oh, I've had some, I've had some fun <laughs> on runway mishaps. I mean, it progressively, over time, it's gotten a bit more, or a bit less awkward, I'd say. But it's not much less awkward. Me and the runway are still not the best of friends. Yeah, there's so many people who kill it on the runway. I have just never been able to master this crap. I've always liked Clement's walk. Clement kills the runway for me. He's just, he's super confident, and, he, and he's just very casual about it. Like, see, my problem with the runway is, if I catch someone I know, it's hard not to stare at them and smile, you know? So you'll be walking down and I'll see Lana or something and I'm just like, don't look at her, don't look at her. So I just try to look forward and not fall. Concentrate, Darren. Do not be distracted by the beautiful celebrities. celebrities. It doesn't sound too difficult, but when you're in that situation, it becomes much more difficult than you realize. I think any girl that can walk in a pair of six inch heels and not fall over is pretty phenomenal to me. I'd definitely ask for more money if they put me in heels. They tried once, I fell over. Heels aren't easy. I'll, t I'll tell you a little thing. So Calvin does this thing. They didn't want any lines in the pants. So when we're getting dressed and everything, all the excitement's building, everyone's getting ready, you know, the champagne's starting to get served, and then my dresser hands me this, this thong. And I was like, what's that for? And they were like, no, you need to put it on so we don't see any lines in your pants. And I was, but that's a thong. <laughs> I remember hiding out in the bathroom while they're checking everybody to see if they're in their, you know, little to hide the lines in the pants. So, because they're quite tight, so they don't want to see the boxer briefs in the suiting, in the sheer fabrics. So I, I remember I hid in the bathroom right until like first looks about five minutes because I was so afraid to put on the thong. <laughs> that, that was my first memory of uh, that runway show. When Sean is asked to talk about his relationship with the heady and glamorous world of fashion, his quick wit and self-deprecating country boy humor chimes in. He says he had very little idea of the brands and the players he would later represent when he started. I thought Fendi was a food. <laughs> no joke. No, I, I, guess, I guess I did a little bit. I had a job at Abercrombie Kids. I got fired from that, though. No. He loves it's... everything in black and white, and he loves brown leather. Like, he's such an old, like, old, old soul inside. He just likes all these, like, antique kind of looking things. On the modeling industry, Sean has a very clear take of it. In his first week on the job, he got to kiss a Victoria's Secret supermodel. And life sort of changed after that. There was a male model that she represented at the time on that set actually, and he had a live bird on him, and I was like, holy hell. I had no, I, like, fashion was, like, I never could picture it. It was unimaginable to me at that point. And I remember that job was with Dan Jackson and Jessica Stam, I think that's the one, right? Yes. And this girl, Jessica Stam, she was like in the Victoria's Secret at the time and everything, and Dan Jackson was like, all right, y'all, if you, if you don't mind, y'all kiss for the picture. And I looked at it and I was like, 
really? <laughs> and I was like, this, but see, this was my first week of modeling. I get the kids this Victoria's Secret supermodel. And I have this five day set with someone from Georgia. So I felt like at home. I never kissed a girl. I, I think it was like 10 more years so I kissed another girl on set. Like I thought that, I was like, what? And the picture that came out uh, was me looking shocked because it was a profile. And then she kissed me on my, it, I was just so excited. I was like, <laughs> and that ended up being the shot. Very early on in his career, Sean was put under an exclusive contract with the all-powerful star-making brand, Calvin Klein. When I first started and Calvin put me under contract, it was an exclusive. But what people don't really know about that is during an exclusive, you can't do anything else. So I'm sitting around doing nothing in New York during the summer and I have this roommate, Jim. Jim, that was my roommate, right, Lana? Yeah, it was Jim, Jim K. And uh, we watched a lot of CSI. And it was right around the time Beer Pong came out. So I kept myself busy. Hit. My first years of fashion were kind of like, especially with the guys when you're young at that, at that point, it's kind of like a college life, like dorm, wouldn't you say, Lana? Especially yeah. the runway and everything. Like after the shows, everyone goes out, gets a drink, goes to dinner, stay up all night to do it, you know, go to, work at six in the morning again. And when Sean is asked whether he had many of the stereotypical temptations that a young male supermodel would be exposed to when jetting around the world, he just shrugs. But that's, that's the crazy thing. I never really did the fashion events or parties because of Lana, she always kept me away because I, I was a little bit wild. So my, my <laughs> times were always spent kind of like in, in, in a more hole-in-the-wall type bar that made me feel closer to home. I was never really comfortable in those really yeah, he always preferred like, and like the neighborhood bar over like some extravagant like fashion party. When asked if the elite level of male modeling is anything like the cult Ben Stiller movie Zoolander, he smiles. I've seen the Zoolander movie. I actually have the pretty much a very similar orange truck, which makes it a bit more uh, funny. I guess. I didn't plan that one out. I didn't put two and two together when I bought the Bronco, but I've definitely gotten some laughs about that when people know my, my work. Smoke a Frappuccino! <laughs> <laughs> yeah! I think in just a broad answer in that, uh, that way, I'd say it's that we're not all idiots <laughs> and we don't have uh, orange Frappuccino fights. Or <laughs> fights or, uh, <laughs> I mean, we do live in models' apartments and in bunk beds. Uh, you do become really close because you're traveling the world together. And so it's nice. It's, it's kind of like a high school reunion every time you do Fashion Week. And it's, it's, been, it's been really nice, actually. I've enjoyed the uh, male modeling environment that way. Now at the very top of the modeling game, Sean no longer feels any pressure or the cutthroat competitive nature of the business. When asked about what has made him such a standout in such a competitive industry, he smiles again. The thing that separates me from others? Well, maybe because I got a little bit of a twang. I don't know, and I, I, I'm under the belief that the more, especially my physical appearance, I try not to think about it as much, like, at, at all. I don't want anything, anything because of this job to go to my head. Like I've found like a really nice place mentally. So this is all very foreign to me to talk about myself and talk about what 
I guess people like about me. I think Sean's appeal is that he is very professional when he's on set. He gets the job done and quick. No one's wasting time with him. He knows what he's doing. He he gets in front of that camera and it's like as if a light switch just turned on and he turns into, you know, forget Kennesaw boy. It's just he turns into this like supermodel. I swear to God, it's like I actually came to set just to watch him shoot a couple times and I was just like, oh, okay, this is why he gets paid the big bucks and this is why everyone keeps asking for him and what it's just like it's just a completely the sean that i know that i have dinners with or screaming matches over the phone with is one sean but the sean that gets in front of that camera and is on set is just like who is that guy Well, the men's shows are different than uh, when you have a men and women's show because they usually address the men in a different area and, you know, just for privacy. And the men's show, everyone just dresses in this big square. Everyone's getting ready, throwing on clothes. It's so rushed, it's so quick. You don't really have much time to think. You're just kind of within the moment. But I remember my first uh, co-ed show and I'm getting ready. It's Lacoste, New York Fashion Week. And I, I turn around, I'm putting on my shirt, and all, all the women are undressing. And I just remember I turned bright red. I, I've, never, <laughs> I, I've never seen anything like that in my life. And I, I remember I turned around and I hide like I, I, didn't, I wasn't supposed to look. It's, it's quite a unique thing being from where I'm from and then getting thrust into this environment of fashion where everyone's so comfortable. And me, I was so uncomfortable at this point in my career. I haven't gotten that out of my system. I'm still quite uncomfortable. <laughs> I mean, let's be real. I dress inappropriately all summer. I'm the only one wearing a sweater. These days, it seems a lot of the models of the moment hunger to be more than just a model. The prospect of the big and small screen can be quite alluring for those who have already made it to the top of fashion modeling. I think at the end of the day, look, anytime a model wants to become uh, an actor, it's always like people roll their eyes like, oh, here we go, another one. I think especially because that was sort of something that was, a, it was a craze back in the day. It was probably the same time I was going from a model to being a photographer, but I think you know, um, like, look, Charlize Theron did it very well. It's funny, I went to a bloody tanning salon once in, in, in the West Village and there was a poster of Charlize Theron up on the wall from the old modeling days. And the Oscar goes to Charlize Theron. From the Oscar. This is the first Academy Award and nomination for Charlize Theron. I, I worked a lot with Jamie Dornan as well for Gap, and he uh, he managed to. And I ran into him a few years later at the airport, and he was like, he was really struggling. He said, like, I'm just having a hard time. I'm, I'm I, I don't want to keep modelling, but I have to keep modelling because it pays my bills. But you know, I'm trying to get you know trying to get a break in the acting world. Um, and then you know, he came out with Fifty Shades. Today, it's not hard to find ex-models who have become genuine Hollywood stars. As well as Charlize Theron and Jamie Dornan, there is the Echuca-born ex-Calvin Klein underwear model, Travis Fimmel, whose breakout starring role was as the charismatic Viking Ragnar Lothbrok for the History Channel. I did not become king out of ambition, but once again, I had no choice as a result of other people's actions. But nonetheless, I am king. King Ragnar. Now, one of Ridley Scott's muses, Fimmel, 
wants nothing to do with his past as a model. Possibly more an actor than he was a model is Wunderkind and male lead of the moment, Timothy Chalamet. Already a legitimate leading man, his star is about to go interstellar as he becomes Paul Atreides from Denis Villeneuve's Dune series. A boy! <laughs> Duncan, can I trust you with something? Yes, always, you know that. I've been having dreams about a girl on Arrakis. I don't know what it means. Dreams make good stories. But everything important happens when we're awake. Hey, you. You want some muscle? I did? No. I mean, I wish it was that easy for, I mean, they probably put in a lot of work. I mean, Timothy Chimelet went to school for years, went to LaGuardia, Travis Fimmel, I mean, Vikings, Dickens. Ashton Kutcher did that 70s show. But when I was given these chances, I don't feel like I was fully ready. And I was ready to accept what acting possesses and needs from me. I, and now I know. So again, at 31, I'm much more prepared for that step, but we'll see. And I guess that's where I'm at with that. And I feel like I always study acting in any capacity because I feel it makes me better with personally, even if I'm not doing it for a role per se or a show. I did Adler, I did a bit of UCB, and I did some Miser as of recently. And then uh, I just did, what was that? HB Studio. I have serious aspirations of learning but I, I like to learn anything. That is uh, one thing is like, if I'm gonna try to act and I don't put my effort into it, it showed. It showed in my auditions, it showed in my comfortability. And I feel that now I've done all this, I guess, class and coursework and it's gotten me much more comfortable and I just think it's practice makes perfect. He's always had an interest in films and when we're working together, you can see him rehearsing things you can see it in his mind, you can see his actions and things like that. So I think he would. Uh, well, Sean has those incredible piercing eyes that, that just like stop everything. I, don't, I actually, I don't think I've ever seen any, anyone with eyes like, like that. Like there's no like Hollywood actor or, or model. It's usually about the chiseled jaw and then like the, I mean, I guess you could probably say beautiful eyes, right? For a guy. They look very masculine on him. He would fit. In an, in an old Hollywood film very easily. He would probably be driving an Aston Martin, <laughs> something like that, <laughs> smoking a cigarette for sure. I think at the end of the day, it's all about timing. It's about that right moment, that right film, that right sort of role that puts them on the map with, where they're taken seriously, um, you know, as an actor. And look, who knows if the kid's got talent as an actor, he's definitely got the face. Uh, but it's one of those things that, I mean, look, I look at actors like Keanu Reeves. Is he the be best actor? Maybe not, but he's managed to have a great career. Oh, you know, and like a lot of the guys like the Mark Wahlbergs of the world, th those guys are killing it, you know, uh, The Rock. You know, and it's not necessarily about their acting abilities, it's more about the way that they look or the way they carry themselves or what they're doing. I think with Sean, it's just about the right role. And, um, you know, look, he's got, as I said, he's got the looks, he's got some, uh, and it's all there, he ticks every box and, you know, he can speak, he can speak good English, he looks good, I'm sure he can read a script. So, you know, I mean, I think he would do really well because he's a very sincere guy, he takes modelling very serious and I would imagine he's going to approach um, the acting the same way. Sean jokingly refers to himself as a music video vixen, but he has also acted on screen amongst notable company in an episode of Veep with Julia Dreyfus and Innocence. I was terrified. I was terrified. I have never been so scared on a set in my life. So I was on Veep and I'd never been on a full dress rehearsal or a set like that before. And I'm sitting at the desk and they're like, action. And so I do my line and they're like, no, you have to act. But I don't want to stand up. No one knows why I don't want to stand up. Everyone else is in their full look suits. I'm in this blazer and board shorts. I'm, I'm wearing sweatpants. But so I stand up and it's actually board shorts and they're coming up to here and they're like, cut! And they're like, what is he wearing? Oh man, I just started sweating. It was terrible. I get so scared. I mean, yeah, I definitely wanted to be there. It's such an experience. And just to be a part of anything deep was great, but I was definitely unprepared. 
for that set. I was just, it's so different than our sets. And we're like, oh, you're a model, you can act. I know it's <laughs> acting so much harder. Let's, I mean, but then you take an actor and they try to model it. Not as easy for them. You know, this is my job, that's why I get paid for it. An actor's an actor's job because they get paid for it. Rock up as a model and think that you can just act. That's not the way it works. Basically, when I see a project that seems like it could be something that you'd be interested in, I send it to Sean. I want to see what he thinks of it and if he's comfortable with it and something that he'd be excited about, and then we take it from there. I'm a music video vixen. He is. He's I think we've had our music videos. Uh... I think I've retired the music video. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know how much my runway on music videos is going to last. You know? no, he actually is really good at the music videos. I'm obsessed with his music videos. Sean's agent, Lana Winters, understands the impact when a model steps out of modeling and into another entertainment field, like starring in a big time music video with the world acclaimed female artist. Taken outside of fashion and put in front of like millions and millions of people, you know, puts a whole new light to everything. That's how you become a household name, basically. Taking his career to the next level, as is the norm for male supermodels. Sean co-starred in Taylor Swift's Blank Space music video, appearing as her love interest. The video came on the heels of Swift selling over 1.3 million albums in the United States during the first week of 1989's release. For the Blank Space music video, O'Pry plays Swift's boyfriend in a relationship that is doomed before it starts. The results, as played out in the video, are entertaining to say the least. Very fortunate to be a part of it. It's like at, at the end of the day, I was a fan first, I, you know, and then I was able to collaborate with her and be a part of her creativity, which was great. Sean also played alongside the material girl herself, Madonna, in her music video, Girl Gone Wild, appearing alongside her in the choppy black and white video of four top male models, Simon Nesman, John Quarter Jarena, Rob Evans, and Sean O'Pry. Of course, they're shirtless and some seem to be kissing. As far as the Madonna video, you know, they used uh, multiple guys and stuff like that. The Taylor Swift video, Taylor, wanted Sean. It wasn't a casting, it wasn't anything. They called me to get Sean. Like she said, I want that guy, period. Like it wasn't, you know, there was no thought about it. And they were trying to convince me, you know, for him to do this for free pr practically. And I said, there is no way that I'm having my supermodel. I get it's Taylor Swift and everything, but at the same time, I said, she has really, really good taste, but you know, we need to work this out. Lana called me and was like, Sean, uh, do you want to do this? And I, before she even finished, I was like, book it. And she was like, Sean, that's just not the way this works out. <laughs>The modeling game has changed dramatically over the last 10, 20 years. Once upon a time to be a true supermodel, you had to rule three kingdoms magazine editorials, brand advertising campaigns, and the runways of the major fashion weeks. Perhaps the odd music video to cross genres. But today, many of the most successful models are judged by another criteria, their social media followings. The reasoning is pretty simple. Book the model with the massive social media following, and you not only get the model, but also their following. It's basic economics. US Vogue has an actual readership of 1.153 million readers and holds the leading position in the top segment of monthly glossy women's magazines in the USA. Kendall Jenner, the highest earning female model of last year, has 186 million on Instagram alone. Clearly, Instagram, reality TV and social media have really been game changers for the media landscape. The dynamics of people building communities and followers and fans and all of that today is hard to ignore. So Sean must have a top-notch social media game. Sean? Wow, wow, no, so this is funny. My social media and me have some issues. I wouldn't have it if Lana said I didn't have to have it. I just post my dog if I have to. Like even if I have to post a picture of myself, I have to ask Lana. Like I'm, I'm just, 
I'm not cut out for it. He'll ask me about which picture I think looks better for him to post. That's how much he hates it and that's how much he's really not that great at it. So he'll send me a selection of like what he wants to post and I'll be like that one. And that's all. No big gang besides the social media. Trying to keep it as real as possible. Partially for me, I don't understand why people follow me. And that's such a hard conversation. Like, oh, we know I'm your biggest fan of what? Why are you a fan of me? You know, it's just, it's, it's unique to me. So I, I'm, I'm still learning. Like I, I'm still under the impression that I got on the Instagram for food and dogs to look at people's stories. So I still kind of run that way. I guess I'm gonna have to be better with this, huh? It's so much work. It is so much effort. Like I've done some jobs with influencers, whatever you want to call them, and they work hard, man. They're doing their own content, they're bringing, they're, they're breaking everything down, doing their own feature films for these little, creating content that people want to see. Like after doing jobs with them, I respect them so much, actually. Because I, I got brought onto one of these jobs and they were like, Sean, you know, just take pictures. <laughs> I'm going around just, oh, that's nice. That's nice. These guys have full film crews going, waking up at six in the morning, going to bed at 11 at night, trying to get all the content. One of Sean's contemporaries and rival to the male model of the moment crown is Lucky Blue Smith. You can say that Lucky Blue is very much so just that, lucky. Now entering his 20s, his 2.7 million followers on Instagram alone it's way more when you add Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, WeChat, Weibo, are not only the teenage girls, but also powerhouse brands, luxury fashion brands like Balmain, Dolce & Gabbana, and Versace. The very same brands that Sean stars for. Smith has become known for his dedication to communicating with fans, frequently posting his whereabouts and interacting with them on Instagram. Weibo in China, and he also has a vlog for his YouTube video channel. I was just exploring, just finding some crabs. He is extensively plugging into social media and is particularly popular in China, where they call him Little Fresh Meat, a common nickname for young, good looking men. Lucky has 350,000 followers on Weibo, one of China's biggest social networks all in addition to his 2.7 million Instagram and subscribers to his YouTube channel. When Sean is asked if he had to be that transparent and exposed, would it do his head in? Would it do my head in? Yeah, it would do my head in. I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't be around. I still am under the belief that privacy's good. You know, I don't want everybody to know everything about me. I think that loses the appeal. If you know what I eat for breakfast and when I you know, shower and me updating you about everything. I get the appeal of it, but for me, that's not how I want to portray myself, unfortunately. The O'Pry household is home to not one, but two supermodels, as the love of Sean's life is fellow supermodel Fernanda Liz. They've lived together for the last two years. She's been called Miss Positive. The Brazilian beauty has not only graced Vogue magazine covers, but the red carpet of Cannes too. Yes, she's a model. Yeah. She's a model. She's a very striking woman. I'm, again, I'm batting above my average. Love her. Love, no, she really is beautiful inside and out. Love her. The Brazilian bombshell started her career as a child model at the age of eight years old and moved to New York for work as a teenager. From that point on, she worked her way to become an international supermodel, working for top designers and being represented by the most prestigious agencies around the world. From getting multiple covers at Vogue Brazil to being the ambassador of major brands around the world, Fernanda has covered the fashion world with her incredible energy and her flawless look. No, she's amazing. Fernanda Liz. Uh, I'm definitely batting above my average. Do you know what that means? Yeah. That's all I gotta say. She's a, she's a superstar. She's a very lovely girl. And it's the first girl I've dated that Lana Cruz Hi, my name is Fernanda Liz. I'm from São Caetano do Sul in São Paulo, from Brazil. And I work as a model. 
So I started being a model actually when I was eight years old. I was crazy to be part of a TV show from Brazil. All these kids, they were all orphans actually. And I was crazy to be one of them. I made my mom crazy to find someone. She never really found anyone from this uh, TV show, but she found this girl that she used to take care of uh, kids model agents. So I went to do this concourse and I got in the first place and then I started doing commercial for kids like Barbie commercial, Bugs Life uh, pictures, the movie and and then when I was 13 I was walking in the mall with my mom and the owner of my agency in Brazil, Mega, he found me and he asked me to, to join them and since then I've been working like for already 20 years all over the world. I've been in New York, living here for 10 years already. And it's a, it was always my dream. I always loved my job and I always worked very hard to, to make it. So I did Givenchy show. That was an exclusive show that actually changed my life and my career on that moment when I did it. I did some covers for Vogue, especially Vogue Brazil. I've been working for 10 years already for Ralph Lauren. I've been, yeah, I've been to Brazil. We, well, I've never been while we've been together, but I've been to Brazil six, seven times. Yeah, but again, like Brazil, when I went there, I never, I was working the whole time. I never really got to go out and see anything. Cause I never got to experience it. And a lot of the places I've traveled are very similar stories. My, my trip involved too many caprinhas and a really bad hangover. <laughs> That's the thing. I mean, when you're doing your job and then you go home, you have to go to sleep. I mean, what am I going to do? Three caprinhas? Okay. Uh, we met years ago at a party and we kind of lost touch. We were with other people and then we were both single and we were talking to a mutual friend the same day about each other and it kind of went from there. Went out on drinks, more drinks, and then she gave me an ultimatum. <laughs> I'm kidding, babe. I'm kidding. She's right there. For me, the one that I liked the most was Mario Testino. I shot for his wet series in Brazil. I love to shoot also with Cedric Boucher, Matthew Brooks. It's one of my, my friends. It's actually how I met Sean. Uh, we were at his party, at the Halloween party, and uh, that's how we, we met. And I mean, we lost contact. And then after a couple of years, we connected again. And that's how we, we got together. When I first met Sean, uh, I felt very, something different about him, you know, like as I like as I normally feel about other guys, and he really surprised me. Like he's such a smart boy and such a kind heart and very genuine, which attracted me a lot. That was like really something that really made me, you know, see something about him in the beginning and made me crazy about him because. You know, sometimes you see a pretty face and then you don't, you know, you don't don't have that connection or the person's not, you know, but he he's that handsome man that for me, he was always the most handsome man in the industry. I mean, in the whole world. And uh, yeah, and I'm very proud of him. I think he deserves everything that he has and he works very hard and he's, I think, I would say his best quality is like he's very kind to everyone that he knows and he's always there to help. I have been to Japan. I love Japan. The courtesy that people display to you is amazing. The respect, the culture, they love golf. The Deki just won the Masters, which was amazing. Great for Japan. Lana says I don't really do a lot of things when I'm traveling, but I do take some time to golf. I haven't seen that. I've golfed in Australia, Turkey, Japan when I was there. Australia was a personal yeah. Australia was a personal trip. I love Australia. I, I I like Australia a lot. Man, Byron Bay is a blast. So I went I went on a golf trip there and played from the Gold Coast down. It was really nice. You want me to tell you when I was there? I don't remember really remember much. It was 
we, we drank a bit too many beers when I was in Byron Bay. Sorry, sorry, Lana, but it's true. Oh, I know. That's what I'm saying. I wasn't like that happy with him. I always worry about him when he's- I the went to the cricket test match, which I thought was pretty cool. I got to be a part of that India, Australia, in Melbourne. That was amazing. There's this photographer that always makes me laugh called Chung Kai Shi. <laughs> Chunky. 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 He's, he's, a, he's a very colorful man and he's just one of a kind. And it, I, there's so many people in this industry that are colorful. It's hard to name one. Their own Everyone has their own beautiful colors. There's a lot, there's a lot of... If anything comparably, I'd be quite dull. Yes. I'd be a very bland color to most of the people in this industry. Like I'd be a beige. Most of the people would be like a hot neon pink, maybe blue. I think Lucky's great. He's really tall. He's very tall, but he's super nice. He's a storm and Mormon man. Again, that's, that's what's great about, I, 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 I can't speak on behalf of female models because I'm not one and I haven't really been around their fashion weeks or their shows. But I'd say in, in the male aspect, in the male side, when we're together, it's kind of, again, it's, it's like a high school reunion every season. So everyone's just really nice, really happy. You catch up, you have your coffee, and then you go to the next show. And then you see your other friends you work with. And so it's like every show you do, you, you get to see a different group, hopefully. And most of the time, it'll be just the same group of guys. Yeah, I was just gonna say most of the time, it's just the same group doing all the top shows, so yeah. And so you go around together for like five years. So if you haven't seen him for six months, it's, you know, it's nice to catch up. That's the thing, when we're together, we're not talking about work. We're talking about everything but work. Casual mom, how, what'd you do this summer? It's not like, oh, what job did you do? If you start talking about work, I go to the deputy, yeah, I go somewhere else. Hey, how much you get paid? Bye, he gone. Soon after his runway debut for Yves Saint Laurent in 2007, he appeared in editorials for Another Man, V-Man, Details and Ten Men. And when it comes to men's fashion magazines, Sean's portfolio shows no shortage. He's also graced the pages of Numero Homme and L'Officiel Homme. My name is James Houston, I'm from Australia originally, fashion, beauty photographer, and I've been living in New York for 20 years. You know, it's funny, I was working on, I've worked on several books. I've had like uh, five books published on my work and each of, the, each of the books that I've published have been to benefit of various cause, whether it's breast cancer or HIV AIDS. And my last book project um, called Natural Beauty was to actually benefit the environment. So what I did was I was reaching out to the, to the best models in the world and a few big celebrities to actually photograph them um, for this particular book project. And when I thought about, um, it's mostly, I mostly photographs women, but I wanted to shoot like just one or two male models. And when I thought about like the ideal male model for me to be shooting, it was you know, Sean O'Pry was definitely somebody that I wanted to go after. I mean, Sean is somebody who is really a model of the moment. He's somebody who is almost iconic. And what I love about Sean is that he's always reminded me of like an old school movie star. He's got that sort of a, a movie star look that is just so iconic and classic. It's almost like a Marlon Brando. It's almost like, you know, somebody that is just timeless. So, uh, and I think it's also an interesting thing with Sean, having the light eyes with the dark hair, it's very sort of striking. And in many ways for me, he's like the Christy Chellington of the male model world. You know, Christy was always my dream to photograph. Um, I've photographed, fortunately photographed Christy many times. And when I thought about um, her face, it's just, it's, it's almost cat-like. She has these amazing eyes and, the, and just the shape of her face, it's just something that I find so, you know, attractive and interesting as a photographer. And Sean really has those similar qualities. The way that his face is structured, the way that his, you know, features work together, he's just got that sort of same sort of feline look in a way. Uh, it's a nice balance of the masculine, feminine, and you know, and it's just a perfect combination. This is really about just sort of doing something that you know, ideas that we had together. I, I shot him under a waterfall, and we shot him with water, and then also used a bunch of like interesting colorful lights on his face as well. And you know what, with, you, with Sean, you get somebody who is 
you know, genuinely a nice guy and you almost, it almost seems like he's landed on his feet in this particular industry, uh, which is kind of like always endearing and it's always refreshing to work with people like that because they're not an asshole, they're not completely up themselves and it just makes it so much easier to work together and to be able to relate to them. Anytime you're working with a top model, somebody who is experienced, uh, whether it be a Christy Turlington or Claudia Schiffer, whether it be, you know, Sean O'Pry, you know, what you're talking about is somebody who knows their light, who knows their angles, and they know, they know that, you know, if you know what you're doing. So really, as soon as they know what you're doing, they, they let you go. But in the beginning, it's more like, okay, so what are you thinking? What are we doing here? And, and, it, and is that where that light's gonna be and everything else? So it's really just, you know, they have to sort of, in many ways, feel like the, they're in good hands because obviously it's their in image as well. They're, they're being photographed by the best, you know, photographers in the world. So it's important for them as well to be protective of their image to make sure it is gonna be um, as good as it can be. Um, and so I find that is the same with all people at that level, which is really, you know, I think, especially right now with what's going on with Instagram and all this other stuff, where you just have a lot of people who are getting a lot of attention or a lot of followers, but they're not necessarily great models. Um, they've got one particular angle that they're shot from, uh, they turn up the set with a full face of makeup ready to go and it's just like it's it's an unfortunate time in a way as a photographer because it's not as inspiring as it is when you're working with like a Chrissy Tollington or a Sean O'Pry because those people or a Daria somebody who's got an iconic inspiring face that is not you know contoured debuggery where you sort of like they're contoured to look a certain way and they're lit a certain way and they retouch a certain way he looks the way he looks that's what you get. Christy Chellington walks in a room and she's just so beautiful and so striking. So I think, um, you know, ironically enough, the project that I worked on was called Natural Beauty and he really does have a very natural beauty. He's definitely supernatural. Oh, I love Sean O'Pry. Sean O'Pry is someone who I've always wanted to work with, but I've never worked with. And he's someone who I will always talk to after a fashion show. I think he's a delightful person. I love his look. I probably love every campaign he's ever been in. But we've never worked together because you have to remember GQ for the last 15 years didn't use, even 20 years, didn't use really a lot of male models. And there was really not a lot of places for um, the male supermodels of the of the early 2000s and mid 2000s to, to find, you know, a lot of pages in GQ. And, uh, but Sean, I think coming up, I'm gonna be doing a campaign with Sean, so I hear. So I'm really looking forward to collaborating with him because I know that I've always admired his look and I think he has this, this kind of quiet, little bit vulnerable, but um, sultry. Reminds me of, almost reminds me of Ellen Delon, like a, like a French or an Italian. Um, actor and I, I I tend to because I shoot so many celebrities and I tend to want to if I'm gonna work with a model I'd love to give them a character or something to play off of. you know there's there are these people that surface where you kind of see them on the catwalk or or in an, in, in, in a magazine or and it's all of a sudden there's just something where it's like whoa who's that? The first shoot with Sean actually was in Venice, and it was a, a funny story that went actually along with it. And um, we we did our first day shooting, and the next you know morning we're on set, and uh, he said I took a gondola ride last night, and I said, oh that's great, you know it's an amazing you're in Venice, it's in, that's an incredible thing to do. And he said, well it's kind of funny. He said I got into the gondola and I was alone. Usually it's you know more than one person, and you know and. and it's this single guy and he said the gondolier looks down at me and says what is a good looking handsome guy like you doing alone in a gondola and that probably is you know i guess as he was sailing by this amazing looking guy in this gondola all alone they must be like like where's where's there's got to be somebody out there who wants to be in this gondola with you but he took a gondola ride by himself i'll say this i've been very fortunate to work with incredible I've been able to work with the who's who of the industry and I am I'm very flattered that and I'm very flattered and how would I say that Lana I'm trying to be as 
diplomatic as possible with this question because the thing is about fashion is I might still have not worked with the photographer that's going to take my favorite picture of all time. You know, I, I still have years to where I get to create with people, hopefully, if the industry allows. And there's still photographers that might change the world, change the game as we know it. So I don't want to, I mean, there's been definitely names that I've worked with that I've highly enjoyed, but I'm quite excited about the ones I haven't. The American model has fronted campaigns for a plethora of the world's most prestigious brands. They include Trasadi, Lacoste, H&M, Giorgio Armani, Bottega Veneta, Calvin Klein, DKNY, Zara, Dolce & Gabbana, D Squared, Marc Jacobs, Ralph Lauren, Fendi and Gap. I'm Chris Coles. I'm a fashion photographer, Australian born, uh, based in New York City and I shoot for fashion magazines, uh, fashion clients, editorials, covers, things like that. How I met Shona Pry, um, I was shooting in Australia at the time and I hadn't quite, I hadn't moved to America and I got booked to shoot a campaign in Korea and he was the model and I'd really wanted to work with him so this was an exciting opportunity to meet him and to work with him and I think it was his first advertising campaign as well. He'd done a whole lot of really exciting editorial and things like that. So flew, we flew to Korea and shot in the studio and our relationship, like, we just got along straight away. It was instantaneous and he was so cool and eager to learn and he was really interested in photography and, and how everything worked and we developed, you know, we, we got along really, really well and shot many, many things after that together. But that's the first time I met Sean O'Fry. Sean's look, I would say it was very sharp, very chiseled, very sharp, very focused look. Does he have a Hollywood quality? He does. He would fit in an, in an old Hollywood film very easily. He would probably be driving an Aston Martin, <laughs> something like that, <laughs> smoking a cigarette for sure. I think what makes Sean special is he puts more than 100% into everything he does. He really tries to take it beyond just, just modeling, right? He becomes an actor for you and he can translate his look into many different ways. What Sean does is he gets so excited about shooting that he wants to be part of every process and understand every process. So he won't just stand there and wait and try to do the best thing. He will really understand what the lighting is and what the attitude is and what we're trying to say in a photograph. Um, it's exciting working with him because we always end up in a place that we've never been before. So we get images that he's never shot with anybody before, which I think is really important. He never tries to give the same thing. He's always trying to give something new. That was a dream job. I remember being on set so nervous the first time because you have to get approval from Mr. Armani. And I was there five days. And I did a picture the first day and then I sat for four days thinking I got canceled. I didn't talk to anybody, anything. I'd show up, I'd do my, get the grooming done, and then I'd sit in this room waiting. And every time they'd pass, I'd look at it. You know, like a puppy. It's like, is it my time yet? Is it my time yet? And then, so I'm freaking out, I'm calling Lana. I was like, you know what? I just don't think it's gonna happen. I don't, because at the time, I, I think at the time, we were the youngest male model to ever do it. Like I was 17, 18, representing this brand for grown men. And so that was our fear, is he too young, anything. But then they shot all the pictures in like four hours at the end of the day. And uh, we did it a few more times after that. They were, and they were very good to me over the course of my career. I kept telling Sean, hang in there. I'm telling they have a plan. They wouldn't keep keeping you on. They would have flown you back if they, if he was not into you and if he like found a problem, you wouldn't have survived all those days. I think I've opened two shows. I've done the runways, their lookbooks. I, I don't think I've done any of their advertising. You have not. Ralph Lauren, uh, I've done their showrooms, uh, their lookbooks. I've been a part of a few of their, their 40th anniversary show, I think it was. No, no, it wasn't the 40th, it was the one before. And it was a really cool show with Ralph because I got to walk through a supercar collection. 
And since I really like to drive and I collect cars, that was probably one of my favorite shows I've ever done, actually. It's amazing. I mean, to be walking, not just in Ralph Lauren and representing the brand, but to be walking next to Ralph's cars and to be able to see something not many people will be able to, to see, it was, it was incredible. Like, I got in trouble because I walked away and I went into the garage. But I mean, like, why not? Like, I, I had to go see. If I had a car collection, it, I don't. I don't think. I, I don't think I'd feel guilty. If I if I had that car collection, I mean, as long as I'm doing good things on the side with you know my money elsewhere and contributing, then yeah, I can have all the cars I want. I guess. When I was younger, with Mark Jacobs, I think I did his first international show, which was in London. And I got to, he was one of the first designers that I worked with consistently and I was doing the lookbooks. And I remember when I was younger, all of my clothes were Marc Jacobs because that's kind of sometimes how they pay you. <laughs> Is they give you, you get to pick your clothes and you go into the room and they let you choose whatever you want. It was, it was really pretty cool actually. And Mark's super nice. Dean and Dan. Uh, so with D Squared, I, I think I, I opened two of their shows as well. Uh, back to back and I got to do their advertisement uh, which were some of the coolest pi my favorite pictures I ever took was Steven Mizell in uh, this car shoot with uh, Marina Lenschuk and Anya Rubik but I remember their runway I was up on this fire escape and I had to walk down and so when I'm, I'm I had to climb down so when I'm going down the fire escape the suspenders they had got caught in the fire escape so I've tried to walk off and I'm attached. <laughs> no one really knows what's going on. So I have to kind of move, maneuver around, untach myself from this fire escape and I have to walk down and I've kind of broken the look. But and so my suspenders are just swirp, you know, all over the place on the runway. But it was, it was really cool to do. Yeah, I've, I've been very fortunate with Hugo Boss to be able to do the advertisements, the lookbooks, to travel with them for runways. Hugo has been someone very intricate in my career. New York, uh, Germany. I've done shows with them in Italy, Spain. I feel like there was another place where we went to a Hugo show, Lana. Remember they, obviously in Stuttgart and Metzinger, but they, they did, did a few other shows on locations and they were some of the most fun. Louis Vuitton I haven't done much with. I remember when we were in Paris and I got confirmed for the Louis Vuitton show, it was one of, at that point, my favorite things in my career, because I just always wanted to be associated with, you know, LV, who, who doesn't really. And when we did a list of goals of my career, and I guess I, most agents do this with their models, so you're on the same page, of which designers I wanted to work with. This was the only one I wrote down that Lana approved of. Everyone else was, you remember that list, Lana? Yes. And it was just completely different designers than what you're saying. And because I wanted to be seen in my hometown mall, which is town center. And we, at that point, I think Gap was our nice board. So I wrote down brands like that, which isn't bad. I mean, I got to, doing Gap was one of the coolest things of my career for me. <laughs> but uh, when I walked for Louis, I remember I called my mom, my dad, I got the show. And it was, it was one of the more exciting things in my career. I like to have peace. <laughs> When I'm not working, I really like to take a step back and recenter myself. So I play three instruments. He actually does, he's very artistic, you know, like he does, he plays piano, he plays guitar, he paints, he draws. And it's, I, I, I feel like uh, he doesn't like much to get compliments. He gets embarrassed. Not that he doesn't like, I mean, who doesn't like it, but he gets embarrassed and he doesn't he doesn't put his himself where he should be, you know, because he's very talented. Anything that he starts doing it or he tries to, he he really he really, really talented. I draw a lot. That's where when you were asking earlier about meditation, my meditation is art. So I draw and I can draw for like eight, nine hours straight. And when I'm not doing that, I, I, I really love my dog. I like working on my cars, and I like being a part of my family. My dog's Tallulah. Uh, she's a 64-pound, uh, very, very beautiful female golden retriever. And uh, she's named after the waterfall, Tallulah Gorge in Georgia. My attraction with cars in general came from I didn't have a car growing up. Even when I left, I drove my mom's Solero without a bumper. 
You know, my brother had a truck, but I had to make my own money to get a car and I, I left too early to get a car. So when I finally had, I, after I bought my mom in the house, I got myself a car. And it was, I'll, I'll talk about my vintage. It was a 74 Bronco and I got it at Paradise Island, South Carolina. And about, I drove it back and about 15 miles away from my house, I blew the transmission to where I could only be in reverse. And so I'm reversing up 575 from exit three all the way up to 20. And a cop sees me and he's like, well, he thought I was drunk driving. So he comes, because I'm reversing up, <laughs> up the shoulder 17 miles in this bright orange Bronco. And then the cop pulls me over and he actually gives me an escort. He gives me an escort and starts talking to me about cars. And then I, it, it just becomes this culture almost of everywhere I'd go, someone would ask me about it and I keep learning, I keep learning. So then I got a 70 Chevelle and I, I hit a tree at 60. And at that point I learned to rebuild a car, you know, because of mistakes. And then I caught on fire in it and I sold it. <laughs> Man, that Chevelle had some problems. And I have a 1951 F100 I inherited from my grandfather. So yeah, I love cars. I'm pretty good. I mean, if you teach me something, I, I can do it. And I learned most of it off YouTube and my friends in shops growing up. But driving, sometimes. Sometimes I, I like to go a bit too fast. So I close the show with one more for the road, Frank Sinatra. And it's probably my worst song I do, but I just love that song. Set him up, Joe. I love it. Probably the opener of the night here without you, three doors down. You know, I just gotta keep the crowd going. I'm not a good country singer. I'm terrible, actually. Maybe some Johnny Cash. The song I do best is Tequila. You know, Tequila. I, I always get like a 95 on that. It's only two words, but I nail it. What does the money mean to me? It's given me the ability to help my family and change their life and mine. I came to New York with $150. I'm still here. You know, I mean, I, I don't know what else to say about that. Bob changed my life. It's initially changed my life. Sean, unfortunately, when he started in the new career, he was 17 and his mother and I were in the middle of a course, which put um, everything in a, everybody has a financial problem going through divorce at the time. And the thing was, was Sean was always wanting to help his family. He, he said many times that he's blessed to have gotten the job he did because he could help his family. And he was always there for us when we needed him. So yes, he was a big help. This isn't gonna last forever. Again, we have a shelf life, but again, because the industry has been behind me in my career and Lana taking care of it, I'm, I've been fortunate. And that's all I can say. I mean, I could have made better decisions, but I'm still here able to talk to you and I have a roof over my head today. What does fame mean to me? I'm, I didn't know I was that famous. <laughs> you know, like, I've, I've kind of liked my career because I've always been under the radar. You know, it's like people, they think they have this view of me. They place me in this certain area. But no one really cares. It's amazing, actually. Not with a mask on. <laughs> but the last year and a half, no one's bugged me for a selfie. It's, it's been nice. But I mean, what if someone comes up, I, it's so weird to me. You want to take a picture with me? Why? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think, it's, I think it's also super cool that people from other countries know who I am. When I, I've never spoke to them. So it, it, for me, again, I'm from a quite smaller town. This is all new to me. I didn't expect this to happen, you know. I was hoping to make some money, go to college. I, I never knew this career would be what it is and like, talking to you. People want to take a picture with me because of what I've done for a living and they, they actually care about who I am. I think that to me is pretty phenomenal. You know, but again, I am such a small scale on that. It's, other people have it much, much more terrible. So, I mean, I get excited. I'm like, ooh, someone knows who I am. <laughs> but uh, I, th I find it flattering. Again, you want to take a picture with me because I'm model? Okay. My fitness regime? I'm much better about it now. So, you know, four or five days a week in the gym right now. But again, I'm... I'm not blowing any hats off when I take my shirt off right now. <laughs> so I just, I, I try to be as healthy as I can. 
I think that what, you know, Bruce's aesthetic was a little bit of different because, you know, not only did he like the guys to be kind of, you know, buff, but he also liked them all American. Like it wasn't like a European look that he was looking for. So even the faces were not exactly of, of how can I say, like anything else. But at the same time, when Bruce was around and doing all that, we did have models that were like big models that, you know, were not all American, not necessarily all American looking, but they had good bodies. You know, they definitely weren't the skinny types that Heidi would like, you know, would like, but they were still, you know, they were, they were still different from what Bruce would want to shoot, if that makes any sense. I'm very fortunate that I started in 06. But I think that, you know, at that era, like you were saying, like, I think that there, you know, there was like the guys that you, you know, you would, you would meet and you would be like, that's a Bruce Weber guy. Like, you know what Bruce would like right away. And then, but you also knew, you know, the other model that was like these gorgeous men that had good bodies, but not necessarily buff bodies, but good bodies. They could take their shirts off and you'd be like, he's hot. Those were some of like the big models of that era as well. But they weren't necessarily falling into, you know, Bruce's category or Heidi's category. They were kind of, you know, they were just the big models of that time. When he's asked about the diversity in the industry in the 2020s, Sean has seen some big shifts to a more inclusive business. 2020, there's definitely a movement encouraging diversity. And not only do I support it, I'm building a company built around that as well. I'm doing a non-binary gender fluid uh, skincare for the family. And I want to represent people that have really never seen themselves in ads before. Which is also something his agent, president of VNY Models, Lana Winters, supports passionately. No, I love it. And I've always been about it. My board, you know, at VNY has always had diversity. All, all ethnicities, everything, you know, for me, it's about the person and what I see in the person. It's not about the color of their skin or anything like that. Never has been. I don't see color. I just see whether I vibe with the person and I see something special about their energy and stuff like that. My set goals in life are the same as they would be in anything I do is that I just hope I take more steps forward than I do backwards. I just want to keep progressing in whichever way that is because if I try to tell myself which way I'm going to pr progress then I'm limiting myself as well. How do I describe myself? If people want to know a little bit about me I'd say a bit country, a bit rowdy, say sometimes a nice guy <laughs> whatever you want to think about me he has a big heart let's put it that way yeah but I know if I'm having to talk about my heart then it's not that big it's just like someone talking about all the donations they're doing I mean you know why don't you just donate I'd say I've coped well in certain points on this journey and I'd say I've not coped well at other times you know it's it's centrifugal it goes up and down and it goes in waves it, you know, it's all over the place. But I'd say at this point, at 31, today I'm in a good place. Today's a good day. Keep me grounded, I'd say my upbringing, definitely my management and my agency, but moreover my family, where I'm from. I'm so, I'm so close with the people I grew up with, so. I'm most proud of in my 31 years that I've been able to give my family a, a better life give myself a better life, to give my name right, an ability you didn't have before. So, yeah, I think that's all you can do as a son, really. The people around me, they've been very supportive of me for the last 15 years. It's nice. I mean, it makes me uncomfortable, because when I'm home, I just want to be home. Not, you know, Sean, I'm probably the model. But now it's just becoming a part of who I am. What I've seen is, the child grow into a very responsible adult, somebody I'm proud of. I've seen him in interviews constantly, always maintains his professionalism. I have watched him mature. He has always kept the values he was brought up with, which I'm very proud of. Some people lose track of themselves. They think too much of themselves. He's the exact opposite. He looks to other people. He looks to help where he's needed. Um, I've 
I had nothing but pride in the way he's grown up. I've watched him just develop into a very mature, very responsible adult. I have done nothing but always thought of him as my son. And watching him grow into what he has become is just phenomenal. I think it's one of the best parts of my life. You always want the child to do better than the parent. Didn't expect him to do this well, but <laughs> he's doing great. Sean has come to town and I've asked him to go see some patients before because I used to work at a place that had a very unique type of patient. We had spinal cord and brain injuries that spinal cord injuries were teaching, it was a rehabilitation hospital, so we're teaching them how to live with the injury. And they're there for months at a time. And these are kids anywhere from age 14 up to adults into the elderly. And Sean would go out his way, he would come up, he would visit, get to know the patients. Uh, of course, proud dad was always talking about him, so they loved it. Of course, the little girls loved it that were there. Um, but pretty much he would go see anybody, talk to anybody, sit with them, take time with them. So they appreciated it. Um, they made them feel better about themselves. That somebody would come there and see them even in the worst part of their life they're at. And when he was done, they were always talking about how much they want to get better. Oh my God, he does this, this is great. He does that, this is so great. And they all they wanted to find out was what they could do in their new situation. So it always helped when he would come visit. I am most proud of the man he's become and how he's handled himself throughout his career. A lot of people could have lost themselves, gone down a bad road, um, thought more of themselves than they actually are. Sean's always kept himself very based and knows um, who he is. Now, part of that might've been the upbringing that Sean, I'm never far away, can always fly up there if I have to. <laughs> and put you back to base, but no, he's always been very even keel, very normal. Yes, I miss him greatly. It's, it's unusual to only see your child maybe five times a year. And, you know, I, yes, I miss him a lot. As a mom, I'm most proud of my child, my boy. It, it really doesn't matter about the success. Yes, I'm proud of that, but I'm just proud of him. I do, but as I said earlier, I'm, I'm under the impression that when I do donations, I don't have to tell the world about it. That's just the way I view it. I feel like if I gotta go scream from a rooftop, I'm doing something right, I'm not doing that much right. So I'd rather let my actions speak for me instead of myself. I support Golden Bond Rescue. I mean, at this point, I wish, I, I wish I'd be doing more, to be honest, but in the pandemic, it, it hasn't been easy to get out and get your hands dirty. Really. So over this summer, I'm definitely going to do a lot more within the community, especially where I'm from, within my home community. And I want to start making where I'm from and having an impact of where I'm from better. When I check out, I, my grandfather, I always ask my grandfather how he wanted to be remembered. And uh, he passed away two years ago by Paget, And I asked him when he was at the hospital and he said, I want to be remembered as a good and fair man. So I think I'm gonna take that from him. That's how I'd like to be remembered, good and fair. And just in his early 30s, Sean has yet to hit his peak in the modeling and acting worlds. In our final episode of our seven part series, we conclude with a look at the 2020 supermodel decade of diversity. Episode seven, the 2020 supermodel decade of diversity.